We are going to finish out notes. So we have been talking about spherical mirrors. We've been doing all these convex and concave, and these are if you took a perfect sphere and you coated the inside or the outside in a mirrored surface. Can you think of an example of that? Wait, both sides are? Like Either one. Um, how about the, the gazing balls that you see in people's gardens, those weird reflective oh, globes on little stands? Okay, that's a spherical mirror. Now, there are some problems with spherical mirrors. So we've been pretending all along that spherical mirrors work just fine, when in fact, you know, as with most things in physics, we're fudging it. There's something called spherical aberration. So an aberration is a distortion or a problem. You know, you can have an aberration in your data set, and you've got this little wrinkle. You've got this funny bit that doesn't quite work. So if you take a perfectly spherical mirror, the further out, so let's, let's draw one of our little spherical mirrors. The further out you get towards the edges of that spherical mirror from any given point as you're looking at it. So when you get out to the rays that are being reflected out at these extremes, they don't really actually meet at the image point, so you get a little bit of a fuzzy image. Um, so this is, this is a problem. This means that we can't use perfectly spherical mirrors. And important, important to know that the spherical aberration is most an issue when you are far from the principal axis. So out in these, out in these edge ranges is where you see the most spherical aberration. You know, in, in this range, it's, they work pretty well. They work pretty well. But you do get funkiness at the edges. Of course. Um, so we can... F you can correct spherical aberration by getting all the rays to focus at a single point and going down to the focal point from there. Um, what this does is it gives you a perfect image all the way out to the edge of the mirror. And this becomes important, like we'll talk briefly about telescopes. Um, most telescopes use a mirror to gather light. The, the solve is what's called a, a, para, a parabolic mirror. It's not perfectly spherical. You all know what a parabola is, right? Yeah. What, what equation gives you a parabola? What function? Yeah, y equals x squared gives you that, the parabola. So that's clearly not spherical. And it's not, it, it's not that extreme, but what they do is there's a subtle parabola to the mirror rather than it being really a sphere and that focuses the, the rays correctly and so you get a better picture out at the edges. You also have probably encountered parabolic reflectors. Parabolic reflectors do a better job focusing things than a straight dish. Um, parabolic reflectors can be found in headlights, they can be found in flashlights, and have you ever seen the little images of wildlife biologists out in the wilds of Minnesota with some weird satellite dish on a stick and their big hiking boots? Seen this? Doing tracking, tracking work. So if you've got an animal with a radio collar, you have a parabolic reflector on a stick that picks up radio signals. And you go hiking until you get a ping on a signal and you narrow in until you can get back into the animal and find them. So parabolic reflectors are, are very useful. They concentrate rays of any sort, sound, light, whatever, um, to a single point. In the world of telescopes, most telescopes these days um, the image that many of you probably have is that you have an eyepiece and that there's a lens here, and that's it, right? And so you gather light in through the lens, and it focuses it down to your little old eye. We do our little universal symbol for eye there, and that's the way it works. But that, there's a very big limit to what you can do with a lens telescope. So most telescopes are actually what are called reflecting telescopes, and they use parabolic mirrors. And so all the big telescopes, if you ever get a chance to travel out west, you should look into, there, there are more telescopes situated out west than there are back east. Why? Okay, so that covers, sorry we didn't record that, why we have more telescopes out west. And you should go visit one if you get a chance, ever. Um, so in a reflecting telescope, you have an eyepiece, but then all around that eyepiece you have a parabolic mirror. So light rays come in, they hit that mirror, they're all reflected to some focal point and you have another parabolic mirror that sits at that focal point 
and that focuses all the rays to your eye. So you get a lot more light in. Um, and in some of them you have a side, you, you have a little eyepiece on the side. So you've got a big parabolic mirror here, a tube here, an eyepiece would go here. So all the rays that come in go to some focal point of a mirror, and typically then you have slanted mirrors and they're focused and bounced until they get to the eyepiece. So you get a lot more light in, in a, in a similar size telescope. An old lens telescope, like the ones that, you know, you might get at the science, they actually show up at yard sales and thrift stores a lot. I have one from a yard sale. Um, they were real popular in the 60s and 70s. And they're, they're good. I mean, you can see the features of the moon pretty well. Um, on a, you can see comets very w well with them. Um, you know, you might be able to get a glimpse of some of the moons of some of our solar system planets, but you're not going to see anything beyond that. You're not going to see a lot of detail. They're, they're fine. Um, these reflecting telescopes do a much better job. And there, there are three major types. You can look in your book. Um, I forget what they're called, but you can look in your book to find those. What do you know about color? So, what wavelengths is that red shirt back there? Absorbing, what is it reflecting? I think you guys all know this. Absorbing all the colors except red. Yeah, it's absorbing all but red. It's reflecting red. Um, the green sweatshirt back there is absorbing all but green, reflecting green. Plants on our planet, chlorophyll bearing plants, green plants, um, absorb everything except green light. And some of them um, also reflect some amount so of yellow. So you'll see things that are sort of a yellowish. So if you put like a green plant, in a room with, like, I don't know. So that, that's a, a reasonable question. Um, if we have a green plant and we put it under a light which is only producing green, which is only producing green light, because remember <coughs> that the photosynthesizing parts of the plant are all the green, the green stuff, um, what would happen to the plant? Well, it's not just how the light looks. So if you put a green filter on a light, you're changing the color of the light, but you're not necessarily filtering out you know, the wavelengths. So remember that the electromagnetic radiation spectrum goes from red all the way to blue with green in the middle. So if you filtered out the wavelengths so that the plant was only getting the green wavelengths, then yeah, it would it would die. It would be reflecting all those. It would not have the light needed to photosynthesize. You can of course split white light into its components with a prism, and right behind. And we experience. We'll finish. We'll finish thoughts on that tomorrow. So we'll wrap it there.